Now, Nicola Sturgeon has apologised for telling a journalist her WhatsApp messages would be released, despite knowing they had already been deleted. Oh. Facing a grilling at the UK COVID inquiry today, the former First Minister said she was simply following policy. And you knew at that point that those messages had been destroyed? Uh, I had... I knew, yes, that I had operated in line uh, with a policy uh, that I had operated in line with and advice that I had had from the outset of my time as a minister uh, to ensure that uh, conversations with... Uh, others in government with any uh, impact or, or relationship to government business shouldn't be kept in a phone that could be lost or stolen, but properly recorded. Oh, well, now we know what her favourite flavoured soup is. Word soup. What on earth was that all about? But it, it's enough to make you weep. Uh, and later on uh, this morning, Miss uh, um, Sturgeon did indeed burst into tears. Uh, because she was so traumatised by having to lead Scotland through the COVID crisis. I think we've got that footage for you. I was the First Minister when uh, the pandemic struck. There's a large part of me wishes that I hadn't been, um, but I was, and I wanted to be the best First Minister I could be during that period. It's for others to judge the extent to which I succeeded. Well, I think judged we have all yeah, done. Yeah, we judged you. <laughs> you didn't succeed. <laughs> Deputy comment editor of the Daily Telegraph, Annabel Denham, is still with us. I mean, let me get out the world's smallest bagpipes uh, to play some sort of sympathetic uh, uh, ditty. Uh, but the thing is, Nicola Sturgeon, time and again now, is being exposed to someone who is a bit megalomaniacal, as she was during the pandemic, as she was in the running of her own party. And then when the buck does stop with her, considering that is what she wants, she doesn't know how to handle it. She deflects responsibility and, frankly, fibs. Well, I mean, there's quite the web that has been weaved here and it now looks like Nicola Sturgeon is trapped in it. And for a long time, I feared that she wouldn't be held to account, just in the way that the SNP mm. hasn't been held to account for its abysmal record in government, the impact that it's had on drug deaths, uh, the backlog on the NHS, the life chances for children growing up in, a, uh, in Scotland today because of the education system, which has just gone into reverse. And there hasn't been adequate scrutiny. And I think we should welcome the fact that Jamie Dawson, the KC north of the border, is really probing Nicola Sturgeon on these important issues. Um, and so much has come out already. Unlike the that lack of Hugo guy a down, few, Hugo yeah, Keith, Vickers, yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, I mean, the, the, there's, there has been lack of scrutiny. Um, we need to be asking questions about why there weren't minutes for the Scottish equivalent mm. to Cobra. More questions mm. to be asked about what the contents were of mm. those WhatsApp messages. Mm. We know some of them, thanks to others who have already already gone before the COVID inquiry, but I still don't think that we've had an adequate mm. um, response she, from yeah, the First Minister. Just, yeah. And, you know, Michael Gove's point about whether the mm. pandemic was used in order to advance the independence cause, uh, because uh, so <laughs> much yeah, well, being well, being weaponised the thought. I mean, a big piece SMP in The Spectator by Fraser Nelson, the editor, uh, this week with the headline, Muck Mafia. Mm. And some of the stuff in that is eye-watering and the big maxim among Nicola and her acolytes was plausible deniability. So they just came up with reasons that they could deny the truth. Uh, and uh, it is not right. She can't just say we had a policy, get rid of WhatsApp messages. There is a chance, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, saying that this is definite, but there is a chance she could have broken the law. These were matters of government that should be public record. So just saying it was policy, mm. not an, it's not good enough. No, I mean, She's in a world of trouble. Obfuscation. And to her wishing that she hadn't been first minister at the time, mm. I don't quite know how you reconcile that yeah. with the fact that she gave media briefings far longer than Boris Johnson oh, did. Gosh, yeah. You know, yeah. she was across the airwaves, you can, I setting out how she was going to do things differently to south of the border, and in the end, excess deaths in Scotland were pretty similar. Let's, to let's not forget the uh, financial scandal hovering over the SNP during her tenure. Uh, she looks very strained there. It looks like she needs a holiday. Perhaps she could go away in a motorhome. Yeah. What do you think?
you know, I always think if the BBC beatifies someone, whether it's Anne Sang Suu Kyi or Arden in yeah, New Zealand yeah. or Watch Nicola out. Sturgeon, before long they turn out to be an unbridled <laughs> tyrant. Uh, now, let's uh, move on to what I think is a massive story. This is the migrant numbers. I mean, yesterday we found out that the estimation is that uh, net migration will continue at about 315,000 a year from 2028 onwards, putting strain on public services. But then we find out that population growth is going to be 90% down to migration. This is huge, not just because when we were discussing this earlier, you're framing your debate very much in economic terms, terms and without doubt it's going to impact on public services. The OBR themselves have said that the influx of migrants don't have any extra participation in the labour market than the domestic population. But I think what really needs to be discussed here is the demographic impact it's going to have, the social and cultural impact. I think that's absolutely right. You can have the economic arguments and the fact that GDP per capita is actually going backwards now. So it simply is not the case that we can import immigrants and that will enable us to continue to grow. But there are very serious concerns, which I think were laid bare by the pro Palestine protests, which we saw not mm -hmm. least on Remembrance Day, about multiculturalism, whether integration has failed and patently in some areas where there are massive community tensions which are only rising, it hasn't. Right, we have a religious studies teacher still in hiding for that uh, Mohammed cartoon. We had a primary school shut down because community leaders threatened to firebomb it. We've now got Muslims saying they're going to try and push Labour out of certain constituencies by standing 90 candidates if Labour don't agree to call for a ceasefire. I mean, the tail is starting to wag the dog and I think we've all got to be mindful of that. Well, of course, we already saw it when there was the ceasefire vote before Christmas. Christmas and some uh, Labour, well, MPs who were on the shadow front benches stood down from their briefs because they felt as though they had a responsibility to their constituents, perhaps they had constituencies with high immigrant populations, that they ought to, to back a ceasefire in Israel, which of course goes against the government's policy yeah. and indeed the policy of the opposition. Um, yeah. So absolutely, I think we've, we're seeing rising tensions across the country and what this has also led to is many people in Britain discovering or feeling as though they are further to the right in British politics mm. than they perhaps would have been before right. October true, the 7th. Actually, yeah. And where does, does that lead us? People, because we haven't it? had a populist party emerge mm. yet in the UK. The itch was scratched by the Brexit vote in 2016. But I think we're due one now. Yeah, yeah. No, I now, think you're right. Now, listen, uh, uh, this is going to be difficult for me. Um, I think I might owe you <coughs> an apology. Well, you have to do an, it on air. You did, an, did, an apology. Did, 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 did uh, we had a bit of a row yeah. about uh, Keir Starmer <laughs> saying that he's going to bring it, uh, ban all conversion therapy. Uh, I, I wasn't wrong what I was saying, but you've okay. made a more relevant point. The relevant point is a doctor friend of mine corrected me after we discussed it. He wouldn't it. let me correct it. No, of course not. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> corrected by never. someone else. I, I, but what it amounts to, that, you, you, you know, uh, conversion therapy for kids is an extremely uh, dodgy area, if you ask me. However, uh, a doctor said that basically if this law comes in and some kid, little kid who's, say, 12, 13 or something, comes in and says to her, uh, I'd like to be a different gender, I'm a boy, I want to be a girl or whatever if she says to that gp says to that kid are you sure about that that will be against the mm. law that was what you were getting at yeah, right trans, and that's so a this disgrace is trans conversion therapy which isn't the same as making a, a, a gay people go to a forest and do star jumps to become straight it's nothing like that this is essentially about talking therapies and not just affirming when someone young or old says i think i'm in the wrong body but actually being able to say well it is that are you sure about that? And I think that this will push vulnerable children into medical pathways that are irreversible. I think it amounts to almost child abuse. I certainly think that, that we have a problem where most people think of conversion therapy, as you say, as being taken to some camp, perhaps in the yeah. southern states of America, yep. where they try to beat your homosexuality mm. out of you. And, of course, that's, to me at least, a, a terrible practice. Right. And it's abusive of it people work. who are going yeah. through a very difficult it's time. And not to mention right. the fact that it doesn't work. But there's an enormous distinction between that and teachers doctors, mm. even parents, trying to support their children who may feel as though mm. they identify as the opposite gender, but may, they might be gay. And if we don't have these conversations, mm. if we essentially have the Labour right. thought police coming yeah. in um, and shutting it down, challenge teenagers, then we will have a situation where more and more teenagers are being forced yeah. down a path 
that actually isn't the right one yeah. for them. Also, one last point, we've got to move on, but, but my point that I was making, which is still relevant, if you're an adult and you're gay and you don't want to be gay, uh, surely you can have the right to go to a conversion therapist, you know, that, that's a freedom of choice. I mean, it won't work, but uh, yeah. banning that, banning a, an adult from making a legal choice, I, a valid choice, mm. I don't know. Let's move on. Uh, gender politics. Uh, turns mm. out, uh, so we tend to uh, sort of treat uh, the 18 to 30 mob as one blob. They all think the same, you know, they're all sort of radical and so on and so forth. Well, it turns out, no, there's a really, well, arguably, no, there's a really interesting report that says that actually the way 18 to 30 people think uh, goes down gender yeah. guide, gender lines and that, that uh, the uh, females are likely to be far more liberal than the males, which is interesting. It is interesting. I always feel a bit uncomfortable so you're wading into very dangerous territory when you start to gender stereotype on the airwaves in mm. Britain today. But it's nonetheless the case, certainly according to this research, that women have different political outlooks, different political views right. to men. Now, this uh, article, which was in the Financial Times, put a lot of it on the Me Too movement, on misogyny, mm. um, and it's a global um, study which mm. has been mm. conducted. And, of course, there are parts of the world in which women don't have gender equality and that might make them lean towards having more liberal societies but you know in the UK what happened in 2019 was interesting because we did see women mm. turning away from the Conservative Party in the way that they hadn't done previously yeah. and that wasn't just mm. uh, Millennials or Gen Z but actually across the board um, and ever since the Tories have been trying to bring in different policies yeah. that might bring them around, such as massive increase in the childcare uh, subsidy that's going to, to parents. Um, I mean, what's interesting, interesting about this, I think, and I've always said a lot of middle-class women are the most dangerous people in society because they're <laughs> the ones... No, they are! They're the ones who don't stand up for women's rights and become trans allies and all the rest oh, of it and yeah. like all the sort of, you know, gender conversion women. and all of this. They are. Middle-class women are Very dangerous, dangerous, believe me. Very Wait dangerous women. sector of society. But but it's biological, isn't it? It comes down to this psychological need for women to want to present as being nice and to follow the herd. Men tend to have that sort of extra mm. egotism that says, I don't mind, you know, standing up for what I believe in. But, you know, Annabelle, people like you and I, we're unicorns. Yeah, Right-wing yeah. women. There aren't yeah, many yeah, of us no, around. No, all you women, you're just lefties. It says so oh, in this God. report. It yeah, says in this report. Disguising it well. I, I, I've got uh, good right-wing credentials. According to this report, you two, just lefties. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annabelle. We'll be <laughs> rejoining you, you in just a little while.